the Sulu Sea, Philippines, an area made notorious by pirates. Here, on the banks of an underwater mountain, is one of the richest coral reefs on the planet. These are the Tabataha reefs, the hidden jewels of the pirate sea. Sulu Sea is in Southeast Asia, lying between Malaysia and Borneo and the Philippines. The reefs are very remote. We journeyed by ship, steaming through the night, lulled to sleep by the soft rhythmic gasp of the engine. Our hotel at sea, the MY Vasco, was built in 1975 as a Soviet Arctic fishing vessel. Early the next morning, we catch our first glimpse of the reef and the ranger station. Our goal here is to dive. Not wasting a minute, even for breakfast, we unpack our equipment from the dive locker. The excitement is palpable. Peter, the dive boss, briefs us. And soon, we are embraced by the clear blue water. So join us over the next 45 minutes and take a peek beneath this incredible sea. Descending into the blue, our first dive is on an outlying reef called Jesse Beasley Reef. Divers can adjust their buoyancy to make themselves weightless. Essentially, underwater, man can fly. The reef is part of an underwater mountain, rising vertically 3,000 feet from the seabed and surrounded by stunning cliffs encrusted in coral. Flying weightless along a cliff face 3,000 feet up must be one of the most exhilarating experiences on Earth. Deep below, a tuna cruises along the reef, a large predator looking for lunch. Suddenly I spot a shark. I'd been looking out for one, since it would be Verma's first shark, and I wanted to film her reaction. For most people, the first glimpse of a shark underwater will simply be a grey shadow in the distance, often not even realising what's there. Verma looks where I'm pointing, but it doesn't register yet. Then, I see recognition and a typical reaction, not fear, but awe and excitement. Verma excitedly gives the shark hand signal. Many people are scared of sharks, but they are more scared of us. We are large, noisy and alien to them. We simply don't look or behave like their food. Apart from the feeling of flying, the exciting thing about wall diving is the feeling that you can simply see anything out here. The cliff walls are covered in coral and fish. As we begin our ascent, the colour and variety of life becomes ever more dazzling. Divers must stop for three minutes at five metres depth as a safety precaution to slowly release gases trapped in their blood. Here, where the wall goes almost to the surface, these safety stops are never a chore. After breakfast, we begin our second dive. We start in the shallows, on the bones of a ship, now called the Malay Wreck. Wrecks quickly become artificial reefs, providing living space for both coral and fish. This fish here is called a sweet lips. The reefs lie just below the surface, almost invisible from above. Many ships have foundered over the years. Here we see the ship's engine, then moving back, its propeller shaft. Many ships have foundered over the years, 
The reefs hit the headlines in 2005 when the Greenpeace flagship Rainbow Warrior 2 struck the reef they were trying to protect, accidentally damaging 100 square meters of coral. We pass over the stern of the wreck and then we swim just a short distance to the cliff's edge. Gliding head first off a 3,000 foot cliff is pretty exhilarating. Doubly so when you almost run into a shark patrolling just below the edge of the reef. We descend and allow the gentle current to carry us along the wall. There are two types of corals, hard and soft. As we go deeper, there are fewer hard corals. They require sunlight. And instead, we see more giant soft corals, such as these large gorgonians or sea fans, which filter food as it flows by in the currents. Higher up the wall, some hard corals, like this table coral, start to appear. As well as corals, one of the other main components of a reef are sponges. Belonging to the family Porifera, they are actually a colony of animals. This is a giant basket sponge. Water is sucked in from the sides, food is filtered out, and the water is pushed out of the center. High above us, I spot a giant Napoleon wrasse patrolling the reef's edge. We'll see plenty of these magnificent but endangered fish in our dives here. A school of fusiliers is watched as they pass above a moray eel. The titan triggerfish can become aggressively protective of their nests during mating season and will actually bite and wary divers. They are far more dangerous than sharks, which are generally inoffensive and quiet. A common myth about sharks is that they must constantly swim to breathe. This is only true for a few species of shark. On the plateau behind the edge of the cliff, we see many white tip reef sharks resting and milling around. Having found our way to the ship's mooring, we make our safety stops at five meters for three minutes. Hanging in the clear water, we are reluctant to leave its embrace. We simply relax for longer than required, watching a life on the reef pass us by. Slow to start, we descend through a cloud of bubbles. At 25 meters, the cliff is completely vertical and full of large filter feeding soft corals and sponges. Let's speed things up and take a quick journey along this deep wall. In the distance, I spot one of the guides swimming rapidly into the depths. Initially I think something's wrong, then I realize what it is. One of the divers, Greg, has dropped a torch. Our guide was quick enough to catch it. Seemingly from nowhere, a school of rainbow runners, a type of tuna, swims rapidly and effortlessly by. We can only marvel jealously at such streamlined grace underwater. Verma hovers and marvels at a brain coral the size of a car. Perched on the cliff's edge, this coral probably took root about the time Abraham Lincoln was freeing the slaves. 
coral this size would most likely be between 50 and 150 years old. A filefish hides close to the cliff wall, confident in its camouflage. While overhead, a giant Napoleon wrasse passes by again. Nature often forms spirals, which follow a mathematical progression called the Fibonacci sequence, just like this nautilus shell and the coral head. Some see it as evidence of God. Whatever you believe, it's beautiful. Decompressing at the reef top, we pause to watch a curious hawkfish. Perched on his coral, he watches us back with equal curiosity. But for now it's time to go. We must return to the surface, reluctantly, and he must go about his business. Our next dive with the video camera was a deep wall near Shark Airport, hoping to see hammerheads. We swim out from the edge, into the blue then descend like skydivers down the cliff. My buddy for this dive is my friend and colleague Jason Peacock. His wife Maria is buddying my fiance Verma as they dive shallower. This was to be a high adrenaline dive. Nothing feels closer to being Superman than flying in the big blue. Slowly we ascend, moving closer to the cliff face. Alas, we didn't see any hammerheads today. Close to the wall, I spot one of my favourites, an emperor angelfish. Normally quite unflappable, this one was spooked by me. He uses a swim bladder to make a drumming noise as an alarm call. We leave the deep phase of our dive behind us. Instead, we relax over the shallow reef crest. Here, we find a cleaning station and a school of some more favorites of mine, the aptly named Sweet Lips. station is an underwater car wash where fish of all sizes come to be cleaned by tiny cleaner wrasses that pick off any parasites. If you were a fish, this would probably feel good, like a long hot shower. The reef crest is the most colourful and vibrant part of the reef. Being next to the surface, it receives the most sunlight. Being next to the open ocean, it receives the most water flow. And from both these sources, the corals get the most food. The 
diversity and number of corals at Tabataha are simply mind-blowing. The shapes, the colours, the density, and especially the good condition. In all, it's astounding. One of our divers, Jim, offers expertly between the corals, never touching them, moving between them like a predator stalking for the perfect photograph. patch of sand between the coral, I stop to watch the antics of a beautiful fire dart fish. Until with my air near in reserve, it is time to reluctantly rejoin the air breathing universe. Our next dive was to be the most exciting dive, drifting fast with the current at the end of the reef, where the two currents merge, which give the site its name, the washing machine. We swim over the plateau and down the reef slope to the drop-off and open sea. Carried along quickly by the current, we are passed effortlessly by two large dog-toothed tuna. Streamlined like underwater missiles, they cruise the boundary between open sea and reef looking for food. The exciting thing about drift diving is that the current moves you along quickly, without effort. It feels like flying. We pass a small white tiff reef shark, the first of many this dive. He is working hard to swim up current. White tips are bottom dwelling sharks and not as efficient at swimming as tuna. We move further away from the reef to float along in the blue hoping to see large open water fish. Things start to happen quickly. A white tip shark, in the distance a turtle, another white tip shark, more tuna. Suddenly I look back and the turtle I saw in the distance is swimming right towards me. Meanwhile, directly below me, I see two grey reef sharks passing each other. Continuing along with the current, we pass through a blizzard of fusiliers that hides yet another white tip shark. Moving up the slope, there is a large plateau at about 10 metres depth, where we find a massive school of jacks. They move in a tight pack, seemingly as one body. Suddenly they take off, as if putting on a formation aerobatics display just for us.
Michael's girlfriend wanted to see what diving was all about, and Ben, the instructor, volunteered to be her superhero and fly her around underwater. The corals on this very shallow plateau receive a lot of nourishing sunlight. This is the richest, most colourful part of the reef. Above the reef, a cloud of damselfish flit in and out, taking cover as our boat goes slowly overhead on its way to pick up our superheroes. Meanwhile, I remain mesmerized by the colors and movement. Ben flies over the reef, coming to tell me it's time to head back. He too enjoyed this quiet, shallow, but pretty little dive. Or maybe it was just having a pretty girl on his back. Either way, we all had fun. Our next dive was to be near Shark Airport. Immediately on descending, we spot our first shark, a grey reef, cruising the wall at about 15 metres depth. We went deep initially for a short time, looking for hammerheads, but to no avail. What we did see was a lot of sharks, most of which were either cruising at 15 meters along the reef wall or simply lying on the plateau in about 10 meters. At depth we pass a school of large barracuda. The geology of the reef is interesting in itself. Here we pass a turbidite channel, a canyon carved by a river of slowly flowing sand over time, even forming waterfalls down the cliff. We saw the wide variety of reef fish on this dive, making this a great time to introduce you to some of our favourite. Sand collects in pools, waiting to flow down another turbidite channel. It looks just like a pool above a waterfall.
make another deep dive at Black Rock, looking for hammerheads. We descend quickly, spending only a minute or two deep. Then we ascend slowly along the wall. The whole dive becomes one long, slow ascent, with stops in shallow depths to enjoy the light. Gliding with the current along the top of the wall, we press some massive, hard and soft coral formations. In the distance, I spot a turtle at the surface, taking a breath of air. Turtles are marine reptiles. They're air breathers, capable of diving on one breath for over an hour. They can live over 200 years and have survived unchanged since the dinosaurs. They're one of the oldest species on the planet, as well as one of the most graceful and most loved by divers. The turtle, curious about us, seems to dance weightless in the water. Sadly, these beautiful creatures face extinction, taking over 30 years to reach maturity and reproductive age. They are at risk from people poaching their eggs. Yet one of the biggest and most common threats to the survival of both sea turtles and albatrosses is plastic waste. In Asia, plastic bags are overused and untaxed. Many people simply fill them up with waste and throw them in rivers next to their homes. Eventually, they reach the sea. Sea turtles eat jellyfish. The problem is, a plastic bag floating in the sea looks very much like a jellyfish. Turtles often try to eat them, becoming entangled and drowning, or blocking their digestive systems. Then they die. To dive with a turtle is a thrill that hopefully my future grandchildren will be able to share with our generation. This is far from certain. Within meters of this turtle, I see a white plastic bag go floating by. I remove it. Maybe this turtle won't be harmed by that particular bag. While it will have little overall effect, as divers who take our pleasure in the marine environment, we are honor bound to do what we can where we can. Shortly after descending, I witnessed an exciting display that was unfortunately hard to capture on video, and I'll see if I can convey to you the picture. We come around a large outcrop. We see a white tip reef shark on the left, and two jacks on the right. Just as crows will gang up to chase away a bird of prey, the jacks chase away a white tip reef shark. Meanwhile, the white tip, feeling very abused, swims back the way we came, passing very close to Burma and I. It's only after the excitement is over and we start to ascend, but I realise that like an idiot, I forgot to flip a filter lever on my camera. Colour restored, this dive, like a previous one, becomes an excellent fish spotting dive and time to introduce some more actors to the stage.
another unusual pairing. This time a jack is buddying a young Napoleon wrasse as it searches for food. The jack is looking to see what food may be disturbed by the wrasse. The curious thing though is how close together they swim. Even in between searches, we hang back and film while two of our divers, Patrick and Michael, inch their way slowly over a sand patch, hoping the two sharks will accept them into their world, however briefly. However, there comes a limit beyond which the sharks will not tolerate the noise from even a patient diver, proving once again that sharks are more afraid of us than we are of them. They swim off, leaving two grinning divers. This is a typical shark encounter for any diver. Just as the collective noun for a group of fish was a school, once again we see the proof that a group of divers should best be described as a fizz. Immediately on the scent, we see another reef shark patrolling the wall. While in an alcove on the cliff, we find a lionfish perched, his home overlooking the abyss. Life doesn't end at the cliff edge. Once over the edge, the reef simply changes its orientation. To these fish, living as they do in the weightlessness of water, sideways now becomes up. Large black coral trees and gorgonians grow on the vertical face of the wall, where their branches can reach into the currents and pluck out morsels of food. Along the lip of the reef, both the orientation and the composition of the reef change once again. The reef rises to within just a few feet of the surface. At this shallow depth we can stay all day in safety, not exposed to much pressure and using little air. For a diver who likes marine life, this is paradise. I dream of dives like this. Spending time in the water gives a diver more chance of interesting encounters. Here, perched on the reef slope, like a seabird, a turtle rests between feedings. This hawksbill turtle is aptly named. With a face like a hawk, they even fly in the water like birds. Our last glimpse at Tabataha is of a giant Napoleon wrasse cruising the edge of the abyss while our turtle glides off its edge. It's a lovely lasting memory of the splendour that is Tabataha, World Heritage Site and Jewel of the Pirate Seas. Say again. Briefing. Okay.
cold. Great days driving. Beautiful sunset, lovely boat. All I need now is a glass of beer. I see you. Tell one of your silly jokes. Always. <laughs> <laughs> silly jokes have in mind when someone says tell a joke. They're not repeatable with blood traffic. Certainly not on camera. <laughs> yeah, you should do the one that we know. We'll just do a quickie on the room. There's Ben. There's Ann. Here's the back of Greg. Hina. There's Hina. There you are, Hina. I can see you now. <laughs> There's Patrick. <laughs> There's Richard. <laughs> There's Marie. Um, Jason. And Marcel. Kate. Greg. And now I push the button again. Oh. <laughs> 